now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Just the facts, ma'am. It is Dragnet. And Jack might have never said that. I mean, he never said it in the context of, of, uh, of Dragnet. I don't know that he ever said it, ever, but uh, that's a myth. Uh, just the facts, ma'am, never came out of his lips that we know of. Uh, from 69 years ago, May 17th, 1953, Jack Webb Dragnet, the big false move. On this Tuesday, 17th day of May, two days away, the 137th day of 2021. We have 228 days left in the year. Now, it was in L.A. on this date, police surrounded a home in Compton where the leaders of the terrorist group known as the Sibionese Liberation Army were hiding out. The SLA had kidnapped Patricia Hearst of the wealthy Hearst family, publishing Empire. Months earlier, earning headlines across the country, police found the house in Compton when a local mother reported her kids had seen a bunch of people playing with an arsenal of automatic weapons in the living room of the home. Now, while she was among them, she recorded this statement. I died in that fire on 54th Street, but out of the ashes I was reborn. I know what I have to do. Our comrades didn't die in vain. The pig lies about the advisability of surrender have only made me more determined. You know, on this date in 1974, L.A. police shot an estimated 1,200 rounds of ammo into the tiny Compton, California home. Six SLA members shot back. Now, tear gas containers thrown into the hideout allegedly started a fire. The SLA refused to surrender. Autopsy results showed they continued to fire back, even as smoke and flames searing their lungs. They clearly chose suicide and martyrdom over jail. Randolph Hearst Patty's father remarked that the massive attack had turned dingbats into martyrs. The raid left six SLA members dead, including leaner Donald DeFries, also known as Sinke. Uh, Patty Hearst not inside the home. She wasn't found until September of 1975. In Washington on this date in 1973, the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, headed by Senator Sam Irvin of North Carolina, began televised hearings on the escalating Watergate affair. We are beginning these hearings today in an atmosphere of utmost gravity. The questions that have been raised in the wake of the June 17 break-in strike at the very undergirding of our dem- democracy. If the many allegations made to this day are true, then the burglars who broke into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate were in effect breaking into the home of every citizen of the United States. One week later, Harvard Law professor Archibald Cox sworn in as special Watergate prosecutor. In the major civil rights victory on this date in 1954, the Supreme Court handed down a unanimous decision in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, ruling that racial segregation in public education facilities was unconstitutional. Now, the historic decision, which brought an end to federal tolerance of racial segregation, specifically dealt with Linda Brown, a young African-American girl who had been denied admission to her local elementary school in Topeka, Kansas, because of the color of her skin. The uh, and, and that should have been the end of that. She should have been admitted to the local school. Instead, in an attempt to gain racial balance, Busing was ordered in many districts, and that was really stupid. It really was. You know, balancing racial equity should be happened through integration of neighborhoods, which has happened in a lot of areas. But there are still, it still hasn't happened everywhere and will never happen because people like to live with the identity of their own. I mean, there are huge Chinese neighborhoods and Japanese neighborhoods and Hispanic neighborhoods and uh, African-American neighborhoods where people live by choice, not by uh, government fiat. 
Uh, let's see, an Iraqi jet aircraft fired missiles into the American frigate USS Stark on this date in 1987. Uh, 37 U.S. Navy personnel killed, 21 were wounded. Four days later, President Tr- on this date in 1987, uh, well, no, four days later, I should say, President Tr- uh, Reagan paid tribute to the sailors. The fallen sailors of the USS Stark understood their obligations. They knew the importance of their job. So, too, I believe that most Americans today know the price of freedom in this uneasy world. Now, it was found the Stark was two miles outside the exclusion zone and hadn't violated neutrality as the Iraqis claimed. Iraq apologized, and Saddam Hussein said the pilot mistook Stark for an Iranian tanker. There was a pilot that probably wasn't trained very well. Uh, Al Unser Sr. announced his retirement from auto racing on the state in 1994, uh, ending one of the greatest IndyCar careers of all time. Radio Quiz Show Information Please first broadcast on this date in 1938. Until Information Please, radio quiz shows generally pose difficult questions to ordinary people. Well, Information Please assembled a panel of experts and intellectuals and asked them tricky questions. The show ran until 1948, and among those intellectuals that were on the show was a fellow you probably heard of by the name of Fred Allen. Alan loved going on the show. He really did. Uh, on this date in 1990, the last episode of primetime soap opera Falcon Crest aired. The show result revolved around the doings at a California winery, and it ran for nearly nine years. Oh, band leader uh, Lawrence Welk died of pneumonia on this date in 1992 at age 89. His shows continue to air to this day on public TV stations across the country. Also passing away on this date, actor Tony Randall, actor, wonderful impressionist as well, Frank Gorshin, uh, Donna Summer, who still loves to love you, baby, and uh, the man who wrote The Cane Mutiny and The Winds of War, Herman Woke. Now, birthdays on this date include, uh, from Tarzan and Pride and Prejudice, Maureen O'Sullivan. Uh, Archibald Cox, the first Watergate special prosecutor we were just talking about, was born on this date. You remember him from True Grip, Blue Velvet, Easy Rider, Land of the Dead, and the TV series E-Ring, Dennis Hopper, from Dodge City, Kansas, born on this date. Uh, from Weird Science, Aliens, Twister, and True Lies, Bill Paxton, also celebrated this day. The very funny man who passed away earlier this year at the age of 65, Danny from Full House, America's Funniest Home Videos, Bob Saget. Uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, welterweight, middleweight, light heavyweight boxing champion, gold medal in the Olympics in uh, 1976. Uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, 66 years old today. The singer Anya, 61 years old today. Uh, the former host of The Late Show, comedian Craig Ferguson, is 60. From Red Sonia, Rocky IV, and Domino, the very tall Bridget Nielsen is 59 years old today. Nine Inch Nails' Trent Reznor is 57, as is Paige Turco. She was April O'Neil in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle live-action movies. And uh, from All My Children, Paige Turco, 57 today. And from uh, NCIS, Sasha Alexander, 49. Though some of the people celebrating the 17th day of May is their birthday, and if this happens to be your birthday... Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say... Happy birthday to you! And from 69 years ago today, May 17th, 1953, Dragnet, starring Jack Webb, on this Tuesday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it... That sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. 
A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need, 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE, 833-34-BIBLE. Quick note to our friends who listen to our podcast through Facebook. I don't know how much longer those podcasts are going to be available because Facebook is planning on ramping things down. And quite frankly, the podcast platform through Facebook only worked on phones. So if you are using uh, podcast apps on uh, to or Facebook to listen to our podcast, may I suggest you download the Spreaker app at Spreaker.com, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Uh, you can get our apps right there directly. Might be the easiest way to do it. Or you can hear them through Spotify or through uh, uh, also through uh the iHeartRadio app, which I find to be the least reliable, but it's there. So I just wanted to mention that up front because uh, this announcement that Facebook was going to be trimming back podcasting, uh, you know, I've been directing a lot of you to that. I don't know. Or even Amazon. Uh, you can get their Audible app. Cost you nothing. Uh, you know, and our content is free through there. So you can do that as well. Anyway, to uh, 69 years ago, May 17th, 1953, here's Jack Webb in an episode of Dragnet entitled The Big False Move. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A suspect has been apprehended. You have a positive identification from the victim. Your job, investigate. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, June 3rd. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 7.46 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery. Joe? Yeah. You're early. Yeah. I got to run over to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. What's the matter? I don't know, Frank. I started to get headaches last night. I couldn't sleep. They're ringing in my ears. I don't know what it is. Now, hold on. Stay right there. What? It's got up my locker. I'll get it for you. What are you talking about? The headaches get worse when you move. What? When you move around, it gets worse, right? Yeah. Feels like your head's going to blow up? Yeah. Uh-huh. Glad you came to me. I know just what it is. Got stuff right up here. Someplace. Yeah, here it is. There you are, Joe. Take two. Got you right up. What is it? Salt. Salt? Salt. That's your trouble. You don't get enough salt. Same thing happened to me last summer. Ever since then, I always keep a bottle of salt tablets right in my locker. Always ready. Take two. Fix you right up. Well, I don't know. You got a penny? What for? A cup? Now, wait a minute, Joe. We're not going to drink that water anymore. No? Just a minute. Bought a whole case of this for us. There you are, boy. Drink it right out of the bottle. What is it? Poland water, Joe. 100% pure. Right from the springs. Real water. Yeah? Yep. Read right there on the bottle, see? Not carbonated. Full of minerals and good things. Yeah, well, Frank, maybe I ought to wait and see the doctor, huh? Joe, believe me, I know what's wrong. It's happened to me. Same thing. Salt, that's what you need. Yeah. There you are. Poland water and the pills. Fix you right up. There they are. Go ahead. Oh, look, I appreciate all this. Really, I do. But I think I ought to see the doctor, huh? Joe. Don't you trust me? Well, yeah. Take the pills. Salt. Salt. Take them. All right. There now, that wasn't bad, was it? If the headaches don't go away, we can drop by Georgia Street and see the doc. Oh, you want to give me the bottle? I'll put the cap back on. Keep yeah. it fresh for All right. Anything in the box? Yeah, an arrest report. We're supposed to check the guy out. Anything on it? 
held up a grocery store at the corner of 7th and Francis a week ago yesterday. When did they pick him up? Last night. Victim saw him on the street and called a radio car, took him into custody, and then booked him. Well, let's go talk to him. I'll see what he's got to say. After we get through, we can drop by the hospital if he's still got the headaches. It shouldn't take too long. Well, sure, guy's already confessed. We ran the name of the suspect, Thomas Stanford, through R&I, but we found no previous criminal record for any one of his description. 8.10 a.m., we drove over to the main jail. We went up to the second floor and signed in. Stanford was brought from his cell, and Frank and I took him to one of the interview rooms. We gave him a cigarette, and he started to talk. He was quiet and cooperative. Yeah, I did the robbery. We could go yesterday. I'd like to check some things out here on the arrest report. Sure, I want to get this over with. I, I did it like I told you. Nothing special. Just held up the store. Mm -hmm. Your full name is Thomas Arthur Stanford, is that right? Yeah, Thomas Arthur. My friends call me Tom. Uh -huh. Your home address is 1824 and a quarter South Mariposa Avenue. Yeah, I live with my father, 1824 and a quarter South Mariposa Avenue, L.A. 7. What's your father's name? Arthur. Same as my middle name. I was named after him. You employed? I'm not regular. What do you mean? Well, I don't have a regular job, like in a factory or a store. I'm a gardener. I work for different people. Can you give us a list of the people you work for? I'm sure if you got to have them. It's just routine. Oh. Yeah, I'll give them to you. You want to tell us how you committed the robbery? Yeah, I'll tell you. Isn't much to tell, though. It's pretty simple. I went in and held the place up, took the money. That's about all there is to it. Were you armed when you went into that grocery store? Yeah. Yeah, I had a gun. What kind of a gun? 32 automatic. Had eight bullets in it. Where's the gun now? Threw it away. Where? In one of the ponds up in Ferndale. You mean up in Griffith Park? Yeah, just a little up the canyon there. You want to show us where it is? Sure. All right. If you start right at the beginning, tell us all about the robbery, what you did. Well, why do you have to know all that? I told you I did it. There's nothing more you have to know. We've got to have it for the record. It's just routine, like I told you. You guys do a lot of things. It's routine, don't you? Yeah, we do. Quite a bit. Was there anybody in the store when you went in? Just the woman that owned the place. I guess she owned it. The way she carried on, you'd have thought it was her own money I was taking. Well, I took out the gun and I told her it was a stick-up. I said for her not to cause any trouble. What'd she say to that? Well, that's when she got hacked at me, started to yell. What'd you do? I guess she figured I meant what I said when I told her to shut up. Anyway, she quieted down, then I told her to get into the back room. They got this little room where they keep the empty Coke and the beer bottles. I told her to get in there. Did she? Yeah, she went into the room and I... Locked the door from the outside, and I went to the cash register and punched the no-sale button and took the money. After that, I left the store. You didn't have the money on you when they picked you up last night. Where is it? It's gone. I spent it. You spent it all? Yeah. Every last nickel. I had myself a ball. You remember where you spent it? All around, different places. I bought myself some clothes, spent some of it in clubs. Just went. None of it left. You drive a car, Stanford? Yeah. It isn't mine, though. It belongs to my father. A big Chrysler sedan. Did you drive that when you held up the grocery store? Yeah, I had it parked down the street on 7th. Mm -hmm. Remember the time when you went into the store? Yeah, it was just after 12, 12 noon. What were you doing in the neighborhood last night? You mean when they picked me up? That's right. Just looking around. You ever been arrested before? No, never been mixed up with the cops. You ever been to the hospital, mental institution? What do you ask a question like that for? Routine. Oh. Uh -uh. Well, when I was a kid, I had my tonsils out. I was in a hospital then couple of days. I don't remember it too well. It was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. How old are you, Stanford? 28. All these questions you're asking me. I told the two cops that picked me up the same things. Why you got to ask them again? Can't you just send me the penitentiary and get it over with? Got to double check the story, Stanford. I suppose so. Just seems that you're going to a lot of trouble you don't have to. I told you I did it. I'm not giving you any trouble. I confess. No. My father know about this yet? Yeah, he was called. He's going to be pretty sore about it. All right. Sure he doesn't know I used his car. <laughs> Nine fifteen a.m. We checked the suspect out of the main jail and took him over to the store that had been robbed. While Frank waited in the car, I went in and talked to the victim, a Mrs. Alice Kenwood. I told her that we'd bring the suspect into the store and ask him several questions about the robbery. During that time, I told her that we wanted her to observe the suspect so that she could give us a positive identification. I told her that it would be better if she didn't talk to him and that if she had any questions, she could ask them through us. She agreed and said that she would do anything she could to help us in the investigation. I went out to the car and... Frank and I brought the suspect into the store. Come on back here, Stanford. What are you bringing me here for? What are you trying to prove? I'd like to have you explain a few things for us. Well, I told you all I could. I told you I committed the robbery. Isn't that enough? Just a couple of things we'd like to have you clear up for us. Well, what things? I told you how I did it. Well, she'll tell you. That's the woman I held up. She'll tell you it was me. She should know. She's the one who turned me in. How about it, Miss Cameron? She's the one, all right. I'd know many places. There, isn't that enough? What more do you want? I'd like to have you show us just how you came into the store, what you did while you were in here. You mean the whole thing? Yeah, from the time he came in through the door. All right. 
Take these handcuffs off and I'll show you. You can show us with them on. It's got to be that way. It's going to make it tougher. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I came in the door. I came in and she was standing behind that counter. You mean Miss Kenwood? Yeah, her. She was standing behind the counter. I walked over to her. I showed her the gun. Told her it was a stick-up. Told her I wanted the money. That's right. He pointed the gun at me and thought he was going to shoot. All right. Go ahead, Stan. Well, she started to yell, told me to get out of the store. Certainly I yelled at him. You think I want anybody coming in here and waving a gun around? Oh, if my husband was here, he'd show you, show you good. See what I mean? I never saw a woman that could yell so much. Go ahead, Stanford. What'd you do then? Well, I told her if she didn't keep quiet, I'd have to shoot her. And then I told her to get in the room Now, back. just hold on a minute. He's not only a thief, but he's a liar, too. Ma'am? That's not what he did at all. What do you mean, Mrs. Kenwood? You didn't tell me to get into the back room. There ain't any back room. How about that, Stanford? You're going to listen to her. I'm the one that robbed the place. She didn't. I guess I know what I did. All right, let's take a look back here. Come on. What's behind this curtain here, Miss Kenlin? Just a little space where I keep my empty bottles. Goes right out onto the alley. There, see, that's where I put her. That's where I told her to stay. Mm-hmm. And you said you locked the door. There's no door there. I got confused. It doesn't make any difference. I told her to get back there and stay there until I was out of the store. That's a lie. You did no such thing. You told me to get down on the floor and cover my face. Then you went over to the cash register and you took the money. I didn't move. Didn't want to give you any trouble the way you were waving that gun around. It's a wonder you didn't try to kill me. The way you're yakking it up, I should have done it. All right, that's enough. Frank? Yeah. You want to take Stanford out of the car? I'll be right with you. Yeah, okay. Come on, Stanford, let's go. I don't know what you got to go through all this for. I told you I did, and I never saw anything like it before. You can't even confess around here. Nobody believes you. You can't even confess anymore. 69 years ago, May 17th, 1953, Dragnet on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The news from 69 years ago comes up next. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us. We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get Pain Magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on this Tuesday, an episode of Dragnet, The Big False Move, as it was originally broadcast Sunday, May 17, 1953. In the newspapers of that Sunday 69 years ago, these were some of the headlines. This week's display of Allied disunity over the Korean truce negotiations viewed by officials in Washington as such a show of weakness that countermeasures must be taken to regain an effective bargaining position. John M. Hightower, writing for the Associated Press, said the action by U.N. truce negotiators at Panmunjom enforcing a recess in the talks over the weekend was explained as fitting into this purpose. So was a statement issued Friday in Washington asserting that the U.S. will never compromise 
compromise away the right of communist prisoners of war to choose freedom instead of communism if they wish. This stands as the key obstacle to an armistice agreement that would end the fighting in Korea. Then in Pale, reporter Jim Nathan Otis returned to the free world yesterday from Czechoslovakia's Pankrat prison, where for two years he was so cut off from outside use that he didn't even know Stalin had died. Stalin's picture was still on the wall, the Associated Press correspondent told about 100 reporters and photographers after driving through the Iron Curtain frontier under escort of officials from the U.S. Embassy in Prague jailed because Czechoslovakia's leaders considered as spying his insistence on reporting accurately about their communist regime. He was pardoned by President Anton Zapotic Friday night and was released yesterday morning. The Army plans to cut its European and Far Eastern troop strength by about 10% in the coming fiscal year to meet Defense Secretary Charles E. Wilson's reduced manpower goals. The combined cut for the two theaters will be about 50,000 men. Another 50,000 man reduction will be made in Army strength within the U.S., and small cuts may be ordered at other overseas posts. Meanwhile, President Eisenhower reported yesterday to be in a mood to crack down on officials who may resist a proposed $5 billion cut in Air Force funds. And how does President Eisenhower describe his wife, Mamie? Here's how he described her Friday, at least, in his address at the College of William and Mary, where he received an honorary degree. He said, my invaluable, indispensable, but publicly inarticulate lifelong partner, Mamie Dowd Eisenhower. And those some of the day's top news stories is reported in the newspapers of Sunday, May 17, 1953, on your radio dragnet, which continues now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Miss Kenwood? Yes, officer. Are you sure that's the man that held you up here? I said it before. I'm positive. There isn't any doubt in my mind. Uh-huh. Well, you heard what he said, how he said he robbed you. Is that the way it happened? Well, everything was the same except where he said that he put me in back there. That wasn't true. He made me lie down on the floor right there, told me to stay still for five minutes, not to move. Said that if I caused any trouble, he'd come back and shoot me. Mm-hmm. I think he's crazy. Anybody would wave a gun around like that. It's terrible. I wish my husband was here. He'd show that snip. He's in the Army. You know my husband. Yes, ma'am. Awful thing. Him overseas getting shot at and young punks like that roaming around the streets with guns, threatening people. It's a terrible thing. Now, this is pretty important, ma'am. I want to ask you once more. You're sure that's the man who held you up? How many times do I have to say it? I told you that it is. He admits it himself. What more do you need? Well, I don't know, ma'am. There's just something here that isn't right about the whole thing. Doesn't make any difference. He's the man. There's no mistake about that. Well, you just let me know when you want me in court. I'll be there. I want to see him get what's coming to him, every bit of it. Yes, ma'am. So do we, if he's the right man. Twelve twenty-two p.m. We drove the suspect back to the city hall for further questioning. Frank took him to the interrogation room, and I checked into the squad room. Pardon me? Yes, sir. Sergeant Friday? Yes, sir. Something I can do for you? I'm Arthur Stanford, Tom's father. Oh, yes, sir. I understand my son is here. Is that right? Yes, sir. He's here. Wonder if I could see him, talk to him? Yes, sir. I think that can be arranged. Has he told you why he did it? Has he? Well, he's given us some reasons, sir. None of them are very good. I can't understand it. Just isn't any reason for him to do a thing like this. No reason at all that I can see. Mm-hmm. I don't know what to do, Mr. Friday. I left the house this morning and all the people in the neighborhood knew about it. They all knew. I walked down the street and they turned away from me. I could see them watch me through the windows of their houses. I could tell what they were thinking. My son's a thief. Common thief. And in my heart, I know it's true. I don't know what to do about it, Mr. Friday. Can you tell me? No, sir. I'm afraid I can't. Well, maybe he can. May I see him? Yes, sir. He's across the hall. This way. Right over here, sir. I uh, wonder if I could have a cigarette. Yes, sir. Here you are. Here's a match. Thank you. I'm not sure what I'm going to say to him when I see him. Wish I had some time to think. Well, you don't have to go in now if you don't want to, sir. Oh, it wouldn't help any to put it off. Won't get any easier with time. I might as well get it over with. All right, sir. Hi, Pop. Why'd you do it, son? Well, I did it because I wanted to. I wanted the money. I didn't know any other reason you robbed somebody. I wanted the money, so I did it. You could have come to me. I'd have tried to get the money for you. You know I'd have tried. Where'd you get it? Where'd you get that kind of money? All your life, you've been grubbing for pennies. I don't want small money. I want to be rich. I will be, too. 
All right, take it easy, Stanford. All right, Mr. Friday, I understand. All my life you've been saying you understand. I'm getting sick of it. As long as I can remember, you've been telling me to get out and do something on my own. Well, I finally did it. Now you aren't happy with it. You expect me to throw my head up in the air because you're a thief? Oh, knock it off. I'm tired of you giving me lectures all the time. Yakety yak. Never stop. That's enough of that, don't you think, Stanford? Well, you keep out of this, cop. This is a family matter. It doesn't concern you. This is between my father and me. Well, tell me why. That's all I want. Why? Tell me so I can face the neighbors, so I can tell me you had a reason. Tell them your son's a bum. Yeah, they know that already, but that's not a reason to steal. It's good enough for me. They're not going to listen to you anyway. They already made up their minds about me. They did that a long time ago. Come on, Stanford. Let's go back to jail. Sure. Anything else here to do? He never understood. He never did. Let's go. Yeah, one thing I'd like to ask first. What's that? You're going to jail for a long time. I have to live while you're gone. <laughs> it's your worry. Man, it always has been. I want to know what you did with the garden tools. I'll have to have them to get along. I don't know. I left him someplace. You remember where? Think. I need those tools. I'm not sure. Maybe at Mrs. Howard's. Maybe that's where I left. Over on 12th? Yeah, I did her place last Wednesday. I guess I forgot to pick the stuff up when I left. It must still be there. And I'll go over and get them. Wait a minute. What do you want? He said he did some gardening for this Mrs. Howard last Wednesday. That'll be a week ago yesterday, is that right? That's what I said. You remember what time you were there? Most of the day. I got there about 10 in the morning. Left about 4 in the afternoon. I was in a hurry to get away. That's why I forgot the tools, I guess. You leave the place at all during the day? Not till I finished. What are you trying to prove with all these questions? It's about the robbery, Stanford. Yeah? If you were at this Howard woman's house, how could you held up the grocery store? Don't make no difference how I did it. I don't have to explain it to you. No, you're wrong about that, Stanford. Is that right? Too many things you don't add up the way you confess. The difference in your story about the robbery. Now, this thing about you being at the Howard house. I don't know why you're lying about this, Stanford. Yeah? But we're going to find out. <laughs> You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. From 69 years ago, May 17, 1953, Dragnet on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on a Tuesday. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. We'll head to the comic books on Wednesday's Classic Radio Theater with The Adventures of Archie Andrews starring Bob Hastings from 76 years ago, May 18, 1946, Jive Talk. It appears Archie and Jug are hep. Archie tries to get a date with Jive Talk, and it works. That'll be on Wednesday's Classic Radio Theater, but now the conclusion of Dragnet, 69 years ago, May 17, 1953. We continued to talk to the suspect, Thomas Stanford, for another hour. He refused to say anything about the conflicting aspects of his story. His father pleaded with him to tell us the truth, but other than admitting he was responsible for the grocery store robbery, he'd say nothing. We got the address of the house where Stanford had said he'd left the gardening tools. 3.15 p.m. After taking the suspect back to the main jail, Frank and I drove out to talk to the Howard woman. Place sure looks nice. Well kept. Yeah. Look at those carnations, Joe. Ever seen anything so pretty? Yeah, they're very nice. You know, Faye tries them all the time. Never seems to have any luck with them, though. Plants come up all right, but the flowers just don't seem to get very big. Mm-hmm. About the size of half a buck. Little bitty things. Yeah. Sure smell good, though. I get the bell. Yes? Miss Howard? That's right. Is there something you want? Police officers, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you. Policeman? What do you want to see me for? Well, it's about a man who did some work for you, Thomas Stanford. Oh, yes, come in, won't you? Thank you very much. My name's Friday, Mrs. Howard. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Oh, well, how do you do? How do you do, ma'am? Just sit down there. 
I'm having a late lunch. Can I get you anything? No, thank no, you. No, thank you, ma'am. Sure you wouldn't have a glass of iced tea or something like that? No, thanks, Miss Hart. How about this man, Stanford? Oh, yes, Tom. He's a good gardener. Does a beautiful job on the place. You should take a walk around the grounds. He keeps it just beautifully. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us when he was here last? Oh, well, I'd have to think about that. Let's see. Well, I think it was a week ago yesterday. Yes, that's right. Last Wednesday. He comes once a week. He should have been here yesterday. Called his house when he didn't show up. No answer. Probably forgot. He's very forgetful, you know. Is that right? Oh, yes. But take the last time he was here. He walked off and forgot all of his tools. Lawnmower, clippers, everything. I had to take it back to the garage. Just left it on the lawn right out in front of the place. Mm-hmm. You ever had any trouble with him? What do you mean by trouble? Well, any arguments, disagreements? Well, on a couple of occasions, we've had words about what flowers to put in. He's wanted to plant one thing, I've wanted something else. They've never been serious, though. Yes, ma'am. I suppose I shouldn't say this. What's that, Miss Hart? Well, frankly, I've never thought that Tom was real bright. He seemed sort of backwards. How do you mean, backward? Well, when it came to thinking out something for himself, he just couldn't handle it. If you told him to do a thing a certain way, do it. Never vary from the way you told him. Mm-hmm. But ask him to figure something out, and he was dead. Seemed like the motor was turning over all right, but he just couldn't get the clutch out. Gears just wouldn't work. Yes, ma'am. That's why I say I don't think he's very bright. He just can't seem to think for himself. No initiative. Do you remember what time he was here on Wednesday? Well, now, let's see. He got here about 10 in the morning. It was right after that radio show about the friends. I'd just finished listening to that when he got here. That goes off the air at 10. Uh, Have you ever heard it? No, ma'am. Oh, you should listen sometime. These people tell why they need a friend to help them out of trouble. Well, I listen to it every morning. Makes me feel pretty lucky, those poor people. I sure appreciate what I've got when I hear what they have to say. Uh-huh. Was Stanford here all day, ma'am? Yes, all day. He didn't leave until, um, let's see. Well, I guess it was about five, someplace around in there. Uh, it seems to me it was just before the five o'clock news, just before that when he left. Mm, they say he got here at ten, and then he left just before five o'clock, is that right? That's right. Any chance that he might have been away without you knowing it? No, no, I'd have known it if he had. He was out in the backyard most of the morning, and then he took care of the front later in the day. Well, what's he do about lunch, Miss Howard? No, what do you mean? Well, does he bring his lunch with him? Once in a while he does, yes. Well, he didn't on Wednesday, though. I'm sure about that. Well, how do you mean, Mrs. Howard? Well, along about lunchtime, it was uh, right after the... Uh, no news. I made up a little plate for him. A couple of sandwiches, potato chips, and some pickles. Little tiny sweet gherkins. I made it up and I took it out to him. Yes, ma'am. I took this nice plate out to him, and where do you suppose I found him? Where? Out by in the garage, sitting next to the compost box. What do you suppose he was doing? A what, ma'am? Reading a comic book. All about cops and robbers. Uh, one of those with a picture on the cover of the crooks trying to shoot their way out of the bank. Mm-hmm. I told him that he'd better get on the ball, let the clutch out, and get to work. I told him that I wanted the yard finished up by five and that I didn't want any funny business about it. What did he say to that? Oh, well, he just looked at me for a long time and then he said, Okay, warden. Just like that. Okay, warden. But he got to work right away and he finished up on time. You see, my son and daughter-in-law were coming over. It was his birthday and we'd <laughs> planned a little party. I wanted the place to be nice for them. Yes, ma'am, we understand. Is it possible that Stanford could have gotten away from the yard at all between ten and five? No, no, I'm sure of that. He was here all the time. All right, ma'am. Thank you very much. What's this all about? Is Tom in some sort of trouble? No, it's just a routine investigation, Miss Howard. I'm going to give you our card in case you think of anything else. Here you are. Oh, uh, thank you. Michigan 5211, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Ask for robbery division. That's extension 2511. It's right on the card. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Poor Tom. All this trouble. It's too bad. Yes, ma'am. I just wish this was New York. Beg your pardon? Well, if this was New York, everything would be all right. How's that? That program about the friends? Yes, ma'am. Tom could sure use one. We left Mrs. Howard's home and talked to some of the people in the neighborhood. They told us that the Howards were respected people in the community, and some of them verified the fact that Stanford had worked for almost two years. The man who lived directly across the street from the Howard house said that he'd talked with Stanford on the afternoon of the robbery. He said that he'd asked the suspect about the seeds that he used to raise the carnations that were planted along the front of the house. He went on to say that he'd been working in the front yard of his own house all afternoon and that he'd seen the suspect throughout that time. We drove back to the grocery store and talked with the victim, Mrs. Kenwood. Under questioning, she admitted that she could have made a mistake about the identification, but she said that if she was wrong, the thief could act as a double for Tom Stanford. 10.30 p.m., we drove back to the main jail and picked up the suspect. We took him back to the city hall and talked to him in the interrogation room. He was sullen and refused to answer our questions. Stanford? Yeah. I'd like to have you tell us the truth this time. I told you it isn't my fault. 
If you don't believe me, it isn't my fault. Now, look, Stanford, we talked with this Mrs. Howard. She told us that you were working for her all day a week ago Wednesday. So what's that proof? Well, you admit it's true then, huh? Sure, it's true. I was working for then her. Then how could you have gotten to the grocery store and held it up? Stanford? I did it. I haven't got anything more to say. I did the robbery. Smith, you got tonight's papers? Yeah, I picked them up earlier. Anything in them about me? I didn't see anything. There must have been something, some story about me with my name. Well, if there was, I didn't see it. Well, maybe you didn't look good. Maybe. There's got to be something, a picture or something. No. Well, let me look. Where'd you leave the papers, Frank? It's quite right. Would you get them and let me look? Sure. Pretty important to you that you're in the papers, isn't it? I just want to see him, that's all. Well, he'll bring him back. He must have made a mistake. There's something about me. There's got to be. It isn't every day there's a robbery like this. The papers would write it up big, wouldn't they? I don't know. Well, sure they would. There was a story when the place was robbed, told all about how it was done. It was just a little story, but now they've got me. It seems you should have a picture. Here it is. Let me see. There's nothing on the first page. Robbery happened a week ago. It's old news. Yeah, but you just caught me last night. Hmm. Nothing. Not one lousy word. Nothing at all. That makes a difference, doesn't it? Sure it does. Sure. If there isn't anything in the papers, how are people going to know I did it? How are they going to know? They won't. But they got it. They got it. Don't you see that? If they don't know that I did the robbery, there ain't no reason for it. No reason at all. What do you mean, Stafford? Well, there won't be no pictures, no nothing. People still think I'm nobody. No one's going to know that I did do something. No one will know. Well, the way it looks to us, you didn't do it. There should be a story about it, about how I confessed. Maybe not a picture, but at least a story, something. You didn't do it, did you? Stanford? Come on, you didn't hold up that story, did you? No. No, I didn't. I thought I could get away with it. I... Thought that if I confessed, you'd put me in jail and people would look at me different. And they wouldn't laugh at me anymore because I'd done something. Mm -hmm. Poor dumb Tom. That's what they say, poor dumb Tom. Just once I wanted to show him, show him that I could do something. You ready to go? Back to the jail? That's right. You think we could stop on the way over and like to pick up something? Yeah, what's that? Other papers. Might be something in them. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 4th, a meeting was held in the district attorney's office, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. A 5.10 report was filed on Thomas Arthur Stanford, and he was released from custody. Ten months later, on May 22nd, James R. Rogers was apprehended while attempting to hold up a liquor store at the corner of 3rd and Temple Streets. While being interrogated, he confessed to committing the robbery that Stanford had been accused of. The physical appearance of the two men was almost identical. Rogers was tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree and received sentence as prescribed by law. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. From 69 years ago, May 17th, 1953, Dragnet here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Uh, I want to remind you again, if you are a listener and you're listening natively through the Facebook app, I don't know how much longer those are going to work because they are doing some changes over there. Uh, We have a link to all sorts of places that have apps that you can do them. Especially, I recommend uh, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Those are where a lot of people are listening. Or you can also listen through the Apple Podcast app. So you can do that there as well if you have a, a uh, an I, iOS device. 
uh, iPhone or all any of that stuff. Anyway, uh, we also want to remind you, please, if you're listening over the air, thank this radio station, support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite radio station. Now, uh, we have a web page. You can also hear our shows there. And that's not going away anytime soon. That is ClassicRadio.Stream. That is ClassicRadio.Stream. There you can stream our shows on demand. Learn more about Classic Radio Collecting. Contact me there. ClassicRadio.Stream. Oh, close circuit to Richard. I got your email. I, 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 it was R.B. Greaves, not B.W. Stevenson I was thinking of. So that's why I got the... And they both, and both have the word Maria in them, okay? That's where I got confused. Anyway, thank this station. Support their advertisers. Tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station.